Around the world, nine million criminals behind bars. Armed robbers, rapists and murderers. Most surrender to incarceration, but some fight back and escape. Tonight, a desperate prisoner pulls off a Houdini-style vanishing act. He was the, the cornered rat, you know, the man who, who had to get away come what may. In Britain, a mass breakout from maximum security spills out into the streets. They've got maps, guns, everything you really needed to escape. And in America, a murderous gang bust out of prison, leaving chaos in their wake. The manhunt for the Texas 7 was the largest I saw in my 23 years in the FBI. This program contains reconstructions. The prison breaks are real. Whitemoor Maximum Security Prison, Cambridgeshire, England, 1994. Just two years old, this high-tech cage is so well set up it's claimed to be escape proof. Within that prison, there is a special secure unit which is known as a prison within a prison. There are only 12 prisoners in this special secure unit, and five of them are convicted IRA terrorists. Peter Sherry, jailed for a 16 bomb terror campaign, sentenced to life. Paul McGee, jailed for killing a special constable, sentenced 30 years. Danny Gilbert McNamee, jailed for his part in the 1982 Hyde Park bombing, sentenced 25 years. Liam O'Dwyer, jailed for terrorist activities, sentenced 30 years. And Liam McCotter, also jailed for terrorist activities, sentenced 17 years. They wanted it to be a war when they'd been captured, and they said they were prisoners of war. As prisoners of war, the IRA believed that escape was a duty. In 1994, the gang form an escape committee and include 32-year-old armed robber Andrew Russell. Their plan is to talk their way out of prison using a psychological strategy known as conditioning. There are two main types of conditioning. One is passive con or classical conditioning, um, where people gradually get used to something, for example. Um, and the other is instrumental or active conditioning, where we will openly reward someone for good behaviour in an attempt to shape their behaviour, to change them. By feigning friendship, the gang plans to soften up the guards and lull the staff into a false sense of security. They created for themselves a sort of regime where uh, they had a relationship with the, with the prison staff that was quite casual. Uh, I think some things were overlooked. They played games, they, um, they played snooker or pool or something with the prison officers. You know, it was that type of regime. It was very relaxed. The nice guy ruse begins to pay off. Visits, once strictly monitored, are now held in complete privacy. Items brought in by visitors are no longer x-rayed. These guys had accumulated as much property that they got in their cells that, that I've got in my house. Their stash was so huge, they asked guards for spare cells as extra security lockers. Amazingly, their captors agree. The inmates seem to get on with what they want to get on with. Um, the members of staff basically acting as lackeys for the inmates. But concealed among the paraphernalia is smuggled in contraband. Torches, pepper spray and handguns. A complete escape kit. They'd got ropes, they'd got maps, guns, uh, survival clothing, glucose tablets, money, everything you really needed to escape. And of course, the uh, bolt cutters that they actually needed to, uh, to cut through the fence itself. The gang are poised for their breakout, but no one has ever escaped from this facility before, let alone from the prison within the prison. Australia, 2006. Just three miles south of world-famous Bondi Beach is Long Bay Hospital One. Holding 120 psychiatric prisoners, the maximum security facility is in lockdown 18 hours a day. Long Bay Hospital is a stark place. It's a, it's a concrete brick um, dungeon. 
If you were a healthy uh, person in the first place uh, and you remained in one of those cells for 18 hours a day, uh, locked with, uh, in fact, nothing in your cell at all, I'd be very surprised if you remained a, a sane person after that. As a danger to themselves and the general public, prisoners are often medicated and sedated. If you put people who are, who are uh, already uh, mentally ill in such conditions, then you, it's a recipe for a disaster, and the level of mental illness there is uh, oh, quite horrendous. Held within walls is 36-year-old Robert Cole. Jailed for rape and armed robbery when he was just 18, Cole had spent most of his adult life in prison. He is now held in the prison hospital at the governor's pleasure. He's had 18 years, and I think the most he's ever spent out of prison was probably three months. And that's the sad situation. I mean, he came out, he was a chronic heroin addict. He could not cope with the outside world. He was distraught, he was concerned. He also felt that uh, he didn't have any, uh, anything in the future, had a sense of desperation. So for him, he was the, the cornered rat, you know, the man who, who had to get away come what may. The hospital wing of Long Bay Prison is surrounded by closed circuit cameras and motion detectors an escape-proof electronic fortress. But Robert Cole has a plan. Believing that he'd found a way to escape through his cell window, Cole began a crash diet at the end of 2005 and rapidly started to lose weight. I understand Robert lost that weight very quickly. To do that, though, he would have had to restrict his food and calories, and he also would have had to maybe even exercise in his cell, but also using laxatives would have accelerated that weight loss to some degree. If you really want, you can find most things in jail. You can always find drugs. So laxative is actually not a hard thing to find, you know, if you have um, uh, contacts inside the jail and you have something to offer. By January, Cole had shed a quarter of his body weight and is becoming ill. Obviously, Robert's mindset would have been very determined, and he must have just, you know, got some strength from somewhere because those laxatives and the dieting and to lose all that weight would have certainly stripped him of all his energy. Now extremely weak from his months of crash dieting, Cole's next step is to smuggle a knife into his cell. How did he get to 20 kilos less and no one picked up on that? That shows you how much he was being supervised. Robert Cole is now ready to pull off a Houdini-style breakout, which will spark a media frenzy and rattle the government. Coming up, the Texas Seven launch their deadly rampage. Take away hope from men, you give them an initiative, and uh, they are practically unstoppable. And in Britain, a mass escape is caught on video. Faced with a prisoner with a gun that's already shot one of their colleagues, it's quite understandable that they would keep their distance. Carnes County, Kennedy, Texas, 2000. The John B. Connolly Maximum Security Prison. It's a tough prison. Prisons in Texas are tough. No prisoner has ever escaped but seven inmates are planning what will be one of the most sensational breakouts in US history. The ringleader is 30-year-old George Rivas, a ruthless armed robber and kidnapper, serving 18 life sentences, totaling 99 years. Rivas had a long criminal history, and his crimes, as I, as I realized as I studied him, were generally characterized by meticulous planning. Rivas has had enough of prison. He figures he's got little to lose by breaking out. There's a saying in the prison. It goes, uh, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I got to that point. You know, I didn't want to die an old man in prison. But Rivas' escape plan requires assistance. He picks six of society's lowest dregs to help break him out. Patrick Murphy, serving 50 years for rape. Joseph Garcia, 50 years for murder. Child abuser, Randy Halprin, 30 years for beating a baby so severely he broke its arms, legs, and skull. Larry Harper, 50 years for raping three women in six months. Michael Rodriguez, doing life 
for murdering his wife. And Donald Newbury, 99 years for multiple armed robberies. The amount of time that everybody faced made them commit the act to get out of prison. A ruthless gang of criminals, both dangerous and determined, they came to be known as the Texas Seven. Take away hope from men, you give them an initiative, and uh, they are practically unstoppable. Revis figures the best way to escape is through the maintenance workshop. The plan was to overpower their supervisors. The plan was to get guns. The plan was to get out of prison. Workshop supervisors are civilian prison employees. Civilian workers are not armed. Revis sees this as the weak spot of the prison security system. It was not unusual for us to be left alone, four or five of us, with one, maybe two, maintenance workers. December the 13th, two weeks before Christmas, the seven get the chance they've been waiting for. They executed the plan during the noon hour and during the time that there was a Christmas party going on, so security was a little bit down at that time. Normally, inmates are locked up at lunch times, but today they ask to stay and wax the floor. The seven are now alone. Patrick Mozigemba is the only supervisor, an unarmed soft target. For the gang, from this point on, there's no going back. We wrestled him to the ground. I was the one talking to him, trying to tell him, just look, nothing's gonna happen to you. He kept asking, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? Essentially, I told him the truth. I said, I want to go home. I don't want to die here. Holding a homemade knife to Patrick's throat, Revis threatens to kill him unless he cooperates. He was struggling a lot. He was the biggest of them. And uh, someone, maybe overzealous, hit him. Patrick is stripped of his uniform, bound and gagged. Minutes later, Civilian shop supervisor Alan Camber comes back from his lunch break. As the other supervisors straggle back, they are overpowered. Well, sometimes they come in one at a time, sometimes three at a time. One by one, they are bound and gagged. Their IDs, cash, keys, and uniforms taken. I think there were 13 that actually finally came in there. So far, Everything has gone exactly to plan. But to get outside the prison walls, the Texas Seven must overpower armed guards. And to do that, they need guns. Cambridgeshire, England, 1994. In the special secure unit of Whitemore Prison, five convicted IRA terrorists and violent gangster Andrew Russell have spent weeks planning an escape. After cleverly conning their guards, the gang have smuggled in most of their escape kit, including a pistol. The next obstacle is a seven meter high outer wall. Persuading the guards they need privacy in their recreation room, the gang set about making a rope ladder using smuggled items, broken furniture and bedding. This went on for a period of time, making up all these different items to get ready for this escape. To hoist the ladder onto the wall, they come up with a cunning solution. Distracting their guards, the gang steal two volleyball posts from the exercise yard. They managed to persuade the guards that they didn't like to be spied on, so they were allowed to put net curtains up at the window, so effectively nobody on guard outside could look in. The poles are snuck into the hobby room. They got modified so that they could be connected together, and the two poles together were long enough to actually take the rope ladder up to the top of the wall. The escape's almost ready, but there's one last obstacle. The gang realize they will need to disable the camera facing the fence. So once again, they lull their guards into a false sense of security. They worked on the on prison officers until they got an agreement that that camera wouldn't be following them around and would actually be facing in a different direction. But just when the gang's meticulous plan is ready, a sudden change to prison routine threatens months of careful work. 
a prisoner had been moved in there that day that they didn't know was coming, but when he arrived, they knew that he was... Uh, he didn't like the IRA, and he most likely would see their paraphernalia that they had prepared to go. By 8pm, the Whitemore Six are in their hobby room, preparing for the breakout. The guards are in another room playing board games. Totally unaware, their charges are planning to disappear from under their noses. We know that the prison officers in the special secure unit control area didn't know anything was happening. They were totally oblivious. Under cover of darkness, the gang breached the first fence surrounding their special unit. Once through, they encounter the second fence. As soon as they start cutting that fence because it's got an alarm on it, that alarm sounded in the control room. All stations escape in progress. The cameras automatically turned onto that area. As the security cameras now focus on the breakout, the incredulous guards can only watch as the White Moor Six hoist their makeshift ladder onto the seven meter outer wall. One of the prisoners had a gun and he was on the top of the fence. And as the first officer, John Kettleworth, made a, an approach towards them, uh, a gun was fired at him. He was hit in the chest, uh, in the abdomen, and knocked to the ground. Having shot an unarmed guard, the gang are now desperate to get off the wall. As the alarms sound, Whitemore Prison is now on high alert. As perimeter guards and their dogs attempt to stop the escape, they're forced to keep their distance. They couldn't get too close because they were being threatened by one of the prisoner, prisoners actually pointing a gun in their direction. And they knew he'd already fired it once, so they were very brave to even stay in the area because we don't have armed prison officers in, in our uh, prisons here in England. Incredibly, all six escapees are now outside the prison and literally on the run. The unarmed prison officers are powerless to stop them. Faced with a prisoner with a gun that's already shot one of their colleagues, it's quite understandable that they would keep their distance. What the escapees did was they used some pepper spray that they got, threw that towards the dogs so that the dogs couldn't come after them. As the gang escape into the night, six armed and dangerous criminals are loose in the sleepy village of Westra. Sydney, Australia, 2006. Inside the hospital wing of Long Bay Prison, Robert Cole, on a self-enforced crash diet, has rapidly lost a quarter of his body weight. I believe Robert Cole must have been feeling horrible. Overuse of laxatives will make you feel nauseous, tired, dehydrated, bloating, and terrible flatulence. So he would have been feeling quite horrible. Undeterred by his constant nausea, Cole has smuggled a knife into his cell and removed the glass from his window. Silently, he begins to carve away the brickwork besides the bars. Unbeknown to the prison officers, of course, of course. And during those, that period, he was slowly trying to slide through the bars and see whether it was actually possible for him to get through. And he discovered by, by chipping, and chipping hit his body, <laughs> uh, he actually uh, found a formula. A formula that includes the physical and chemical makeup of the very bricks and mortar which hold him prisoner. Mortar in the olden days was made with lime instead of cement, which means it's much more affected by the weather. So the proximity to the coast of those bricks and mortar would mean that it was a lot more friable and affected by the salt, so it would be easier to wear away over time. Whether Cole has calculated this weak spot in the prison's armour or just struck it lucky, he spends weeks scraping an escape passage. Finally, in the early hours of 18th of January, and still undetected by the guards, Cole's escape hole is ready. He creates a dummy in his bed by filling his pillowcase. But to escape, he still has to overcome the prison wall, a security fence, and a high-tech ring of electronic security systems. Carnes County, South Texas, December 2000. At the maximum security unit, 
a gang of convicted rapists, murderers, and child abusers, led by kidnapper George Reavers, are now in control of the maintenance workshop. Having overpowered their civilian supervisors and taken their uniforms, the gang put phase two of their escape plan into action. Reavers phones the tower and convinces the guard that a maintenance crew is on its way to fix a faulty surveillance camera. I spoke the talk, I guess. I talked the talk, walked the walk with it. Believing that Reavers is a genuine staff member, Officer Vernon Jansen buys his story. Masquerading as a maintenance supervisor, Reavers brazenly passes armed guards as he heads to the tower. I kept on walking, saying I was going to the tower to go take measurements for the monitor. I walk up there. Uh, I had never seen that officer before. He was an older man. And I looked around, and there's a holster with a uh, revolver sitting on a table. I said, is that loaded? He said, yes, it is. And I got the holster with the revolver, and I told him, listen, uh, I don't want you to get hurt. Just cooperate, and uh, everything's going to be all right. At gunpoint, Rivas forces the guard to have the gates opened as the rest of the gang casually climb into a prison maintenance vehicle. We have four hiding underneath. Three of us are up front. Just drive right out. Incredibly, Revis and the gang drive slowly out through the front gates past the unsuspecting guards. Seven armed and desperate felons are now loose on the streets of Texas. Do not approach these people. Contact law enforcement, whether it's us or any of the other agencies. Uh, let us do what we need to do on this and get these people into custody. One step ahead of the massive manhunt, the gang drive to a nearby shopping center, swap vehicles, and vanish off the police radar. It was a very well executed plan. They had the cars outside. They knew exactly where they were going to go, the cars they were going to steal. It worked. Choosing to stick together, the Texas 7 drives 60 miles to San Antonio, hide out for two days, and then head for Houston. We were all aesthetic, honestly. Uh, we knew there was a serious manhunt, but every day was precious to us. The freedom of uh, walking to the corner store and buying a soda and a newspaper, and the clerk saying, good morning, how are you? It was absolutely beautiful. To afford their new lifestyle, the gang reverts their old ways. I had planned for us to rob, to get money, buy clothes, food, shelter, a vehicle, and purchase some IDs. First, they steal $10,000 from an auto supply store. Next, to stay one step ahead of the law, they rob an electronics store for police scanners and walkie-talkies. When we learned that they had police scanners, it affected the way that we, that we communicated amongst ourselves, because we did not want to give out any information uh, on those police scanners, on those police frequencies that would aid and abet the, the escapees. Continuing their trail of chaos, the gang called up a sporting goods store on Christmas Eve. The gentleman gathered us up to the front of the store. George Rivas pulled his revolver, said this is a holdup. This is not a joke. As the gang escapes with $70,000, stolen guns and ammunition, they are confronted by Officer Aubrey Hawkins. I fired one round first at his right shoulder. Uh, now I cursed. I screamed at him and cursed for him to raise his hands. Officer Hawkins dies in a hail of bullets, shot 11 times. And as if to send a message to those pursuing them, they then pulled his body from his car and ran it over with their getaway vehicle. The really sad part to me is he answered that call while having uh, Christmas Eve dinner with his uh, wife and nine-year-old son. When Hawkins was killed, our greatest fears were recognized that somebody had been killed. Unfortunately, it was a police officer. Whether I fired the lethal round that did kill Mr. Hawkins or not, I did initiate it. I am at fault, and I do take full responsibility for it. To kill a police officer in Texas is a very bad thing to do. It did up the ante. After brutally killing a police officer, the Texas Seven are now the most wanted men in America. Coming up, 
In Britain, the police hunt down the Whitemore escapees. That's interesting. That is very interesting. And in Sydney, Robert Cole slips out of his cell, but... He still had to find his way to freedom and to enter at some place of safety. Australia 2006, at the maximum security hospital wing of Long Bay Jail, Robert Cole is poised to execute his escape. Using a crash diet, he has lost a quarter of his body weight and carved a small hole in the bricks next to the bars of his cell. Squeezing his 56 kilogram frame through the 15 centimeter gap, Cole drops to the ground. Staying low to avoid being spotted by the guards and the motion detectors, he crawls across the yard. A sense of, of pleasure, of exaltation, a sense of triumph, a, a sense of the, you know, the, the individual achieving you know, something that worked very hard for. Uh, but of course, at the end of that, uh, uh, he'd done it by himself and he had no people outside to assist him and assist him at the other end. He still had another wall to, to, to overcome. How Cole manages to scale the prison wall and run along the top without being detected is still a mystery. Forcing his way over the razor wire, he cuts his legs on the way down. Using a pillow for protection, Cole climbs the perimeter fence, but cuts himself again on the barbed wire. I'm really not sure how Robert got that strength to get over that fence. You know, after all, what he had to do to lose that weight, I'm surprised he had any energy left because everything would have been depleted. And he still had to find his way to freedom and to enter uh, some place of safety. Badly injured and exhausted, Cole disappears into the darkness. A violent and mentally ill criminal is on the run tonight after going on a crash diet and slipping through the bars at Long Bay Jail. Robert Cole is mentally ill, very dangerous, and it would appear very smart. The publicity that followed his escape, it was quite remarkable. You know, he was on television, he was on, on newspapers. He's planned it, he's looked at the staff movements, he's looked at how it operates, I would imagine, and he's managed to escape. The jail security manager has been stood down as police hunt the escapee. Robert Cole is the first man ever to escape from Long Bay's maximum security hospital wing. Robert Cole is off his meds dehydrated and on the loose in the eastern suburbs of Sydney. His mind, obviously, at 36, after being so far on the drugs, is a mess. It is said in law enforcement that if you don't catch a prisoner within three miles or three hours of an escape, you're in for one hell of a manhunt. At Whitemore Prison in England, Six dangerous prisoners have escaped from the special secure unit by scaling the wall using a homemade rope ladder. I would think the whole escape took about 10 to 15 minutes before they're running along the outside wall. Having already shot a guard, the gang flee. Amazingly, their every move is captured on prison security cameras. Prison officers in the UK are not armed, uh, faced with a prisoner with a gun that's already shot one of their colleagues, it's quite understandable that they would keep their distance. And all they can do now is actually follow them at a slow pace. And you can see from the video that the dogs are even confused as to who the, who's the enemy, you know. The chasing guards tackle Paul McGee as the remaining escapees run for cover. Their plan was to obviously get away from the lights of the prison, get out into the open countryside, and they where they were heading was towards an old disused railway line. Right, four arms used, uh, prison officer's been shot. As the manhunt swings into action, a police helicopter is called in to hunt down the gang. Uh, suddenly we can come into our own and, and serve assistance with the night sun, which is the searchlight, and the thermal image camera, which will be very good in that dark area, which is uh, also very cold and hot bodies should show up very well. On the ground, police are being rapidly deployed to attempt to corner the gang near the disused rail line. The police had arrived at that location. This was now dark. Uh, they had searchlights with them. Uh, they shone the searchlights and saw these prisoners coming towards them. They shouted at them to get down. Just 15 minutes after their breakout, Liam McCotter, Daniel McNamee and Andrew Russell are recaptured. 
Authorities must stop the armed and dangerous Peter Sherry and Liam O'Dwyer from reaching the main road, where they will disappear from the thermal imaging screens. Yes, sir, received. Do you want uh, the light there, or shall... What we'd like to do is try and sweep search and try and contain the air as much as possible before they get a chance to get us outside the area. In Dallas, Texas, seven dangerous escapees have been on the run for two weeks. The manhunt for the Texas 7 was the largest I saw in my 23 years in the FBI. During an armed robbery, the gang killed Officer Aubrey Hawkins. It was such a brutal killing, they pulled him out of the car, shot him multiple times, ran over him. Now, as cop killers, the Texas 7 are being pursued by every law enforcement agent in the country. A police killing in this country is looked on as about the most serious crime there is, and everybody really pulls together. Hoping to throw their pursuers off the scent, the Texas 7 flee over 800 miles north to Colorado. No one expected Colorado. Everyone expected us to go to Mexico. They'd gathered guns and ammunition along the way. They'd stolen, I think, 16 weapons at the prison, but now they were into high-powered weapons, weapons that could defeat body armor. On January the 1st in Colorado Springs, a group of men check into the coach light RV park. They said they were missionaries from Texas and, and uh, had gone to California and were working their way back to Texas, and they all kind of portrayed that part. The men appear to be living totally normal lives. They aroused no suspicions. We spent time in the Word. We, we studied the Bible. We had coffee together. So nothing seemed to be out of the ordinary for me. But then, on the 21st of January, the television show America's Most Wanted runs a report on the Texas 7. Several times they've thought they've had them cornered, but each time they've slipped away. A trailer park resident recognizes them and tells Wade. It was them, and I, and I, mean, I was just, I was totally in shock, I guess, um, doing the, this little town, this little, our little RV park has these seven notorious criminals here. Wade Holder immediately contacts police and agrees to assist them. I came in at the usual time, business as usual, and we had a SWAT team follow me in, in a motorhome. So we, we got here, and, uh, and I got out and checked the exterior, kind of make sure nobody was looking, and shuttled the crew into the building. Wade makes plans to meet with rapist Larry Harper the next morning. So the plan was set. 10 o'clock, he would come down, have coffee. They would pull him out and then find out where everybody was and proceed from there. The FBI set up a command post. SWAT teams arrive in the area. As the Texas 7 have police scanners, all radio traffic about the operation is banned. My first thought was, once we get these guys located, put a perimeter in, don't let them go anywhere. By the next morning, the trap is set. With FBI, County Sheriff's Department, and SWAT teams in position and ready to strike. Larry Harper is meant to meet Wade at 10 a.m. But 45 minutes later, there's still no sign of him. Child abuser Halprin and rapist Harper are still in the RV. A negotiator is sent in. He began calling on the bullhorn, we know you're there, you're surrounded, and uh, there really is no hope. Halprin surrenders, but Harper stays inside. We were attempting to negotiate him out, and during the negotiations at 12.40, we heard a gunshot. And we knew he was he had shot, he'd taken his own life. The SWAT team stormed the RV. They find Larry Harper dead a self-inflicted shot to the chest. Next to his body, an open Bible and a letter of apology to his family. At the same time, another SWAT team surround Rivas, Garcia and Rodriguez as they climb into their car. There's a man in front of me with a AR-15 pointing right at my chest. The car was still on, he was in gear, I had my foot on the brake. But as they pulled these subjects out, literally weapons were falling out of the vehicle. The subjects admitted that had they had an opportunity to get to their weapons, they would have shot it out. Rivas, Garcia, and Rodriguez are taken into custody. The reason we did this is because 
we didn't want to be in prison anymore. And here we are going back again. With one now dead and four captured, it was only two that were still on the run. We do have a trail now. We do have leads that we can follow up. Uh, and we're not that far behind them. They only had uh, a few hours head start on us. In Cambridgeshire, England, five IRA terrorists and a gangster have escaped from Whitemore Prison's special secure unit. Four have been recaptured. But two members of the IRA, Peter Sherry and Liam O'Dwyer, have disappeared into the darkness. What we'd like to do is try and sweep search and try and contain the area as much as possible before they get a chance to get us outside the area. A police helicopter with heat sensing equipment has been called in to search for the escapees. But authorities know that if O'Dwyer and Sherry hijack a car on the main road, they will vanish from the thermal imaging screens. Uh, we're going to, in fact, uh, take the road out of March. The escapees have been on the run for two hours. That's interesting. That is very interesting. Hello, John. Which way is the wind? Uh, they're moving along. The chopper's thermal unit is returning a powerful signal from two hotspots. If you go to this return, it's quite bright in a ditch just off the side of the green swarm to the right-hand side as you're heading north um, at the edge of the field. Over. Yeah, we're moving across the field. Uh, I say that to reach your location. I'll guide you uh, in. Hold your location. You are approximately 10 yards from on towards your left. These two returns are in the ditch. As the chopper coordinates from the air, police on the ground close in. Dwyer and Sherry are captured and returned to Whitemore Prison. If it hadn't have been for the police helicopter with the heat-seeking equipment, uh, they may well have escaped. Oh, lovely. Lovely, lovely, lovely. An investigation has begun into how six prisoners, five of them IRA terrorists, managed to obtain firearms inside a top security prison in Cambridgeshire and use them in their escape. News of the breakout causes a public outcry, which intensifies when a prison search reveals an inmate's paint box hides enough explosives to demolish a prison cell. Security procedures in the British prison system were immediately overhauled. The whole situation in relation to X-ray equipment and uh, security of people getting into prison, and then further security, obviously, in, in visits to the special security unit, completely changed things. And that wasn't just at Whitemore Prison, that was nationally. But amazingly, the Whitemore Six were given no extra prison time for their breakout. In fact, they never stood trial. Charges were brought against them twice, but media breaches led to both trials being suspended for fear of bias. And, in a final ironic twist, the escapees themselves sued the prison for violence against them, following their recapture, and won their case. Next, Robert Cole is spotted. He was discovered with a, an almost farcical way, um, having, uh, having painted a texture-colour uh, uh, beard on his face. And in the Texas manhunt, he's five down, two to go. These two guys were armed to the teeth with weapons. At any moment, they could explode. Australia, 2006. Robert Cole, a mentally ill prisoner has chiseled his way out of Long Bay Prison Hospital and is at large in the eastern suburbs of Sydney. There's no question the impact on the community as a whole was actually enormous. He was actually on television as a, as a major issue on, on the front page of newspapers. It was seen as being an audacious escape. As prison escapes go, this one was pretty ingenious. A prisoner at Long Bay Jail went on a crash diet until he was thin enough to squeeze out of his cell. He then scaled the prison walls without being spotted because the watchtowers were unstaffed. I believe that he is a threat to the public in the highest manner. As a massive manhunt swings into action, Cole's sister makes an emotional plea. I would beg him to come back. 
I know that he feels that he's not going to get any help where he was. I don't know what sort of drugs he's on at the moment or lack of drugs that he's on. I don't know what he will do to try and get those drugs. I have no idea. Robert will have been very confused, dehydrated, and he would have been agitated and not a nice person to be around. After two days on the run, Cole has vanished and by now could be hiding out anywhere in Australia. And no doubt the general community was concerned because uh, uh, he was a person who was accused of a sex uh, an offence, uh, who was uh, on the loose, uh, and I don't doubt at all many people were concerned, locked their doors and made sure that they weren't walking in the evening. Uh, it would have affected people's lifestyles. On January the 21st, three days into the manhunt, police receive information that Cole has been brazenly walking the streets just three miles from the prison. We have intelligence suggesting that he has been in the Bondi area since his escape. He was discovered with a, an almost farcical way, um, having, uh, having painted a texture colour uh, uh, beard on his face, and try, a disguise that was not going to work at all. A painted on uh, pirate beard and moustache, just painted. He would have felt, felt so depressed, uh, he would feel as though he didn't have nothing to live for. Robert Cole received an extra 21 months for his escape and is now incarcerated at Sydney's Silverwater Prison. As a forensic prisoner, he is held at the governor's pleasure and has no release date. Colorado Springs is in a state of chaos as the FBI hunt down the Texas Seven. After the suicide of convicted rapist Larry Harper, four of the gang have been recaptured. But rapist Patrick Murphy and armed robber Donald Newbury are still at large. Those two are still on the run, heavily armed and extremely dangerous. As authorities continue their search, a tip-off leads them to a brown van in a restaurant parking lot. This morning around 6 o'clock, uh, this vehicle was detected by employees of the Hungry Farmer. Now, in conjunction with the federal authorities, they have confirmed that this is, in fact, the vehicle that the fugitives had been using. Murphy and Newbury have slipped through the police cordon as the FBI widened their search area. I worked at the Howard Avenue Garden of the Guard. I checked someone in last night. Okay. Are they still there? Yeah. We were just, it kind of looks suspicious. Police determine it definitely is the two remaining escapees, Murphy and Newbury. Hiding out in a room at the Colorado Springs Holiday Inn, just two blocks from where the van was found. They knocked on the door and said, we're with law enforcement, we know who you are, and then started negotiation. The duo threatened to come out shooting if their demands aren't met. These two guys were armed to the teeth with weapons. At any moment, they could explode. They want their say on local television station, KKTV. A phone interview is organized with anchorman Eric Singer. Newbury uses his airtime to criticize the Texas penal system. I've done crime, you know, got a face to music. But they're giving kids so much time that their life is gone. Now all they are is a, a, a roach in a, in, in a cage. Things have to be changed. There needs to be more rehabilitation in, in the system down there. You know, I can't, couldn't even go to college. Come on, where's the rehabilitation when you can't even help yourself? Donald Newberry was a rebel without a cause. He had felt he'd been wronged by the state of Texas. He'd felt that his life had turned into this. When the interview ends, Newberry and Murphy give up without a fight. Handcuffed and heavily guarded, Donald Newberry and Patrick Murphy Jr. walked out of a Colorado Springs hotel and back into reality. We feel extremely fortunate that this happened without any injury to anybody. Uh, that was our objective from the beginning. For the murder of Officer Aubrey Hawkins, all six remaining members of the Texas Seven received the death sentence. With the death of uh, Mr. Hawkins, a death sentence to me, I feel personally, is fitting, I deserve it then, so I'm not gonna fight it. On the 14th of August, 2008, Michael Anthony Rodriguez was executed by lethal injection. The five other members of the Texas Seven 
await their fate on death row. Next time, in Australia, a violent gang smashed their way out of prison. Was capable of, of really what we call true evil. In Britain, a sleepy village under siege by three murderous criminals. These people had capacity to do harm. And in America, a Spider-Man style breakout. You're 85 feet from the ground and you're on a rope that you that you made out of bed sheets, you don't know it's gonna hold you. Thank you.